giving you a voice, making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. First Updates Now, FTC is produced in partnership with the Orange Alliance. Now FTC is a platform to keep up to date on live and archive first tech challenge events and team stats at theorangealliance.org. And by viewers like you. We need your help to keep fun loud, live, and independent. Help us by visiting our Patreon to pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now. You can also support fun live on Twitch for a few bucks a month or by linking your Prime account for free and clicking subscribe. Hello and welcome to FTC Live. Tonight we have an awesome interview lined up with Matthew and Raymond from Team 4546 Viperbots Snakebite, including questions about the Viperbots program of eight FTC teams and one FRC team, in addition to a look at what goes into being on Snakebite. And of course, some questions from you guys in the chat. So go ahead and ask some questions of these awesome people. A little later on, we have a giveaway from Redfish Robotics of a First Updates Now mug. So stay tuned for your chance to win. Reporting for FTC Live, I'm Ethan. If you have any questions that you would like uh, us to read uh, during the show, please tag at first updates now um, as you type your question into chat. I'm Shashir, and uh, Matthew and Raymond, would you like to introduce yourselves a bit underst- uh, and uh, give us an idea of what you do on your team? Uh, so I'm Matt, or Matthew, I kind of go by either one. Uh, I've actually been in FTC for four years. I did FLL for two years. Um, I've actually been on Snakebite for four years, which is pretty rare for Viperbot since our RA teams, a lot of people kind of shift around a lot. And uh, I'm kind of the hardware and design lead for our team. Um, yeah, I'm Raymond or Ray. Uh, I've been on Team 4546 for two years, um, and I do most, most of the software. I'm the software lead of Team 4546 Snakebite. Awesome. Yes, we have kind of the two ends of the spectrum, hardware and software. Yeah. All so, right, so... Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I was going to ask, what is it? So you mentioned that you it's pretty rare for somebody in Viperbots to be on the same team for a while. How does that system kind of work? Um, so every year, there's kind of... Everyone in Viperbots has to actually reapply every year. Um, and in addition, there are rookie applications. So once all those applications are done and people are accepted or denied, because um, it is a pretty selective program, despite being so large, um, after that, uh, each team has a project manager and once that role is filled, that's how the teams are kind of sorted out, is each project manager kind of does like a draft type system um, with a certain like caveats. You know, some people kind of stay on the same team if they want to. Um, it's really kind of in the hands of the students. Um, so you do see some people move around for different reasons. However, there are a decent amount of people who do stay on the same team. Um, so I've kind of always just found my home with 46. I've always liked being on the team, always liked the people, uh, despite people graduating every year. Um, and I've kind of just, people kind of know me as 45, 46, or a member of that team. So you kind of get some identifications with your team, uh, but some people are kind of known to move around. It's just kind of whatever style you want to take. Yeah, each each team has a kind of different atmosphere. Like some teams will be more on like the humorous kind of comical side. So um, at the end of the year, you can fill out whether you want to be on the same team or not. If you um, And if you feel, say you don't want to be the team, you have the chance of getting a team with a better atmosphere that um, hopefully you mesh better with. Uh, that's one thing I like about the end of year application, but I've been on forty five, forty six my whole career. <laughs> Interesting. Do you feel like that helps drive motivation in students that they can like keep up throughout their team with a fear of maybe being transferred? Um, I don't feel like it's it's much, it's not really much of a fear. Um, I kind of made it maybe sound like that, but it really kind of is in your option. So if you okay. put on your reapplication that you want to stay on the same team. Uh, then they really do try to keep you on your team. You know, you won't get moved off if uh, unless there's some conflicts within the team that maybe need to be resolved. Um, so I wouldn't really say it's much of a fear. Uh, some people might think of it as a new opportunity. You know, everyone might kind of know that someone's going to leave the team towards the end of a season, st- kind of stuff like that, I'd say more. Yeah, it's also a good um, opportunity to kind of shuffle around the experience because generally teams with fewer veterans get earlier picks. So the veterans who they generally get veterans who put they want to be on a different team, so it kind of evens out the playing field a little bit. Interesting. So, so as someone, I've been on three teams in my FTC career. Is it a big switch to switch from one Viperbots team to another? Uh, that's actually a good question. Personally, I'm not 
very I've I've never switched, but um I've kind of seen it go both ways. Some people did switch teams and had a great experience. You know, maybe they were able to do a lot more or maybe they got rid of some conflicts they maybe had with certain other members on the team. So for some people, it certainly does give them a great boost for what they can contribute or just kind of their enjoyment of the program. Um, However, I've also seen people kind of move away from a team thinking they wanted a new opportunity, but really kind of still gravitated back to a team and maybe wish they hadn't switched. Um, Uh But I think that's kind of interesting because... If you do get to be in the program for four years, you know, you can either switch around, try to find your home, or you can just find your home and stick with it. Yeah, for sure. So with that, it sounds like we're going to talk a little bit about our giveaway. So tonight, we're going to give away an awesome First Updates Now mug courtesy of Redfish Robotics. We love you guys. So Tyler, do you come on and tell us tell our viewers about how to win? There we go. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, absolutely. If you're interested in winning the uh, cool Redfish Robotics mug, which we're uh, delighted to partner with and give away for this show, all you have to do is make sure you click that little follow button near the top of the screen. Uh, keep up to date on all shows we do. Uh, we do both FRC and uh, FTC, and we can't wait to pre- be producing more FTC content throughout the season. Uh, if you do uh, choose to subscribe, we'd love to have your support for that. You can do so for free through Twitch Prime if you or your parents have it. Or for a few bucks a month, you can do so. You'll get five times chance to win. We're going to have a keyword near the end of the show uh, that you'll have to type in, and then you'll have an opportunity uh, to win this mug. So thanks again to Redfish Robotics, and good luck to everybody. Enjoy the rest of the show. All right. So that's uh, uh, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Tyler, for uh, introducing our giveaway. And thank you guys, Matt and Raymond, both for um, talking about how your how the Viperbot dynamic is, because I'm with nine teams, eight FTC and one FRC. I I can't imagine just how complex that dynamic might be. Um, So um, but I I would like to start off, um, if you don't mind, with you guys individually. So how what what have your guys' individual experiences been with um, FTC? How have you guys uh, how how have you guys learned and how have you guys grown through this process? Uh, so I guess I'll go ahead and start. So my freshman year, um, I came in as a rookie, kind of wanting to do software, um, actually, and kind of just being on the team. You know, I, Viperbots kind of has the veterans are really strong, um, just because the prestige of the program. So rookies kind of you you start kind of shadowing i mean you do a lot of stuff but you kind of just start with figuring out what you like to do and so i thought i wanted to do software but i ended up doing hardware um so freshman year you know you know you kind of just do kind of the machining you don't do too much design um so that's what i was mostly doing my freshman year got really good with the tools stuff like that and the same thing kind of continues sophomore year but once what's nice about viperbots is once people start graduating you kind of get more and more control of over what you do and that's kind of where I gravitated towards CAD and design. Um, and so junior soft, junior and senior year, I kind of did more of the design aspect. And then it's also a great way to incorporate the rookies because, you know, like I said, I started out machining parts. So I was able to start CADing parts and give those to rookies to machine. Um, so that, on 46, that's kind of how we've done our lineage. Uh, you know, if a freshman or someone, a rookie does want a CAD, you know, of course, we incorporate that as well. Um, but personally, that's kind of how my four years kind of developed. Yeah, my situation was a little bit different. Um, when I joined, um, our software team was completely rookies. There's no veterans on there. Uh, but the good thing about the Viperbots org is that in our robot room, the, de- the tables are only like a few feet away from each other. Um, so if you have a quick question, you can ask someone on a different team to get some their expertise. So even though our team was completely rookie, I had some help from people on other teams, and I was able to catch up to speed in a few months um, to do more complex software things later in the season. And um, unlike Matt, I started as software, stayed as software. Uh, <laughs> so that's nice. that's really interesting like how big is a room to fit nine teams um our t te- our room it's it's it used to be bigger um we've kind of been adding teams over time when i started there was only six ftc teams yeah. so it's definitely gotten yeah, more cramped about, over time it's about as big as like a basketball court like um i think that'd be a good kind of comparison um and this includes both FTC and FRC kind of work, workstations. That's not bad. Do you guys just have one field that all all teams share? Uh, so for a decent amount of the season, before FRC build season, we have two FTC fields. Um, but once FRC starts kind of kicking off, they convert the second field area into more room for FRC. Um, so as sometimes like the week before competition, we'll set up a field in the hallway or in another room just to get more teams running autonomous or practice matches. Um, so yeah, most of the time it's it's one field for FTC. Yeah. Nice. 
So in terms of uh, your FRC team, I believe last year was their rookie season. Am I right? Yes. Correct. So how did the how did the dynamic of the Viperbots organization change when you added like this other resource intensive program? This other like on, honestly, it's a it's a program on a different time schedule, right? So mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. Uh, as Adam asked on the chat, do, does the do, how, what's like how does how does the FRC team integrate with your FTC team, and how do you guys diverge as the season sort of split? Um, so. Every year, uh, I mentioned the reapplication process. Um, so you, as a veteran, you get the option to either reapply for FTC or reapply for FRC. Um, so if you did FTC your freshman year, you can apply for FRC um, at the end of the year. And if you get accepted, um, you're now a part of the FRC team. Yeah, um, and, uh, yeah, yeah it's a little bit different. Um, you, can, you can apply for FRC now as without any FTC right. experience, I guess. But yeah, yeah. Um, and in terms of how we work together, um, it's pretty separate. Um, it's a little interesting now because the FRC team is so young. So most, almost everyone on the FRC team started out in FTC. Like last year, I knew all of them. So, um, you know, we're still kind of friends and it's not completely separate. We still talk, obviously we're in the same room. Um, but in terms of working together, you know, it's, it is pretty separate. They have stuff they need to do. FTC has stuff they need to do. Um, but it, you know, if there is any help that needs to be done, uh, you know, it, 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 everyone's free to ask and stuff like that. So it's still a collaborative. Yeah. Um, during the early part of the season, like before FRC starts, um, they're not really, you know, they have off season stuff, but they're not completely busy. So it's a good idea for FTC team members to sort of bounce design ideas and stuff and ask for advice from them. And um, it's pretty collaborative between the FTC and FRC environment. Interesting. I know there are a lot of people who do both FTC and FRC. Can you, as a student, have an option to do both? Uh, no, not really. You, you don't have the option. Yeah. They're kind of limited. Uh, I mean, you can be heavily involved in FTC, you just won't be an official member. You can, like, help one particular team out a lot. But, um, actually this year they group it, so you have to help three-ish teams out. Um, yeah. And while that is a, and while that is a dynamic that happens, it's still up to the students. So, like, I know for, for us, 45-46, we don't really want much FRC involvement. We have a few people that are uh, assigned to help us, but, you know, like, we just kind of talk with them and they kind of understand that, you know, like, we don't really want their help, kind of, it's, uh, it, it's different for other teams. Some teams like the more involvement, uh, other teams don't like us. Um, it, you just kind of play it by year and, uh, you know, you talk to the people, they're your friends, it's not a big deal with uh, that kind of stuff. Yeah, so kind of leading off of that, back when Vibrobots started, what led you guys to choose FTC over FRC? Um, so I was actually in the org when it was just FTC and I remember when FRC was rolling around, it sounded really interesting to me. Um, but like I said, you know, my freshman and sophomore year, I didn't really get that much opportunity to do what I wanted. And I felt like by the end of my sophomore year, which is when FRC was just starting, um, I felt like I really understood FTC and I finally had a chance to, you know, like be good, I guess. Um, so for me, it was more like I wanted to keep mastering my FTC abilities rather than move on to the next level and have to start relearning everything. Yeah. Yeah. That's very fair. Yeah. That's basically why I stayed um, in FTC too, because I spent uh, the first year, you know, getting the Android Studio kind of um, the stuff for FTC down. I didn't want to like restart and feel like I spent the, ho- the past year building up towards nothing. I just kind of want to really rock FTC instead. That's, yeah. that's very fair. Yeah. Because I, yeah. I, uh, I, as a part, as having involvement, in both teams it's in both levels it's been hard right because it, you you really need to focus and i think that that's quite important um so i i one question is again going back to the to the rather enormous viper bots organization how do you feel like being in such a large program uh challenges you as a team um certainly there's very high levels of competition you know uh viper bots are kind of we're, we're renowned for having good teams you know uh, people do well every year at worlds and stuff like that so being in such a big organization with so many teams next to you and near you, uh, for me, it really motivates me. You know, At the end of the day, we are all friends, but we're also competitors. And so it's kind of nice to be able to just look across the room or look to the table next to you and see where an- another competitive team is at a certain point during the season. Um, and especially with more than one team to look at, you, got, you, know, you have seven others to look at. So it's really nice uh, motivation for me personally you know, to try to get better, try to enable that friendly competition between us. Um, you know, and just kind of 
yeah, overall, I'd say it's really motivating to be in such a large, large program with a lot of other students who are as passionate as uh, I am and we are. Yeah, it's also kind of nice because you get to see kind of what's possible. Like, you might be above average and autonomous, but the rest of the org might have better end games. So it really pushes you to focus on the areas you're weak at because you have direct comparisons every day. With that, do you guys feel like Vibrobot's teams like steal ideas from each other or things like that? Um, <laughs> I definitely say it's kind of a a balance. You know, uh, people people really i mean we are very competitive in reality against each other uh we are all friends we share tools and stuff but you know people are pretty secretive with their designs um it's hard to be super secretive you know because you do have to test on the same field as another team but uh i mean i don't think people go out of their way to try to steal stuff people might see how something works and try to innovate off that but there's no like blatant copying there's no sharing of cad you know everyone's still working themselves as a team um and individuals but yeah, definitely there are yeah. some ideas that get kind of passed around and ideas and, yeah. Yeah, software-wise, I don't really think there's that much copying because, um, to be quite frank, I don't really know anyone else's GitHub in the org. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, like, but you might see something, see, some, see something, someone's robot do something physically with software and ask how could you do that too, but the code will probably be different. Like, um, for instance, our team was the, was the first this year to use a webcam for the sampling objective. Now there's like five teams with webcams in the org. <laughs> yeah. So Absolutely. a question from chat. Um, Huppadu? I don't know. However you say that. Um, let's see. Asks, what's the best way to get rookies involved in your teams? Um, I guess I'll go ahead and start. From a hardware standpoint, um, it's really it really depends on the rookie. Um, I've always tried to make it a mission as kind of hardware lead and like a, as a veteran, as someone people look up to, I've always wanted to never limit anybody on what they wanted to do because I know as a younger student and rookie, I was kind of limited by the people above me. So I wanted to make sure that that didn't happen. So I really just, it's all about communication. You got to ask them like, do you want a CAD? Do you want to build stuff? Do you want to like machine? Um, and fortunately this year, most of my rookies were really interested in kind of machining and the actual physical building process of screwing stuff in. And that worked worked really well for me because I, I'm more of the design side and CAD. So I was able to just kind of CAD a design and then show them the CAD and kind of, they would kind of pick up how to build it. And uh, they're very good now. Like I'd, I'd even say some of them are better than me at physically putting stuff together. So that's kind of how our team dynamic works. Um, just, it's just, like I said, it kind of depends on what they want to do. One of them, some of them do want to CAD and, you know, I help them. I teach them CAD, uh, have them make certain parts and stuff like that. It's a pretty collaborative process between the veterans yeah. and rookies. Uh, Software-wise, I just have like a pretty simple policy of like never reusing code, even like reusing code from previous years. Even if it's the most simple thing, like you know, turning on a motor, I'll have a rookie do it just so they can get the time experience behind it. Um, they, using this, um, but I don't. I'm not gonna give them. I'm. Uh, I still give them like hints and stuff like that, so they'll get up to speed faster and be able to, you know break more ground with their more, more knowledge from experience. So um, Odrith asks from the chat, um, how often do your teams meet per week? Because, uh, like, how often do you get your space and how often are you able to, how often are you able to do things? Um, so our school, our mentor, actually, uh, we go under the UIL, which is kind of the Texas um, Scholastic League guidelines, which limits us to eight hours a week. Um, however, the room is open more than that. So the room is open on uh, our school. It's out around four o'clock and on Mondays, it goes till 730. And then every other day of the week is 530. Um, and so the way that process kind of works is uh, every member signs in and then that tracks your hours. You sign in and out every day. And then that's how you make sure you stay within the eight hour um, amount yeah. of time. If you go in more than eight hours, you, you actually get kicked out by the mentor because he, he wants us to stay within the rules to make it fair because we do compete yeah. at the end of the year in the UIL event. Um, but in terms of how often the room is open, it's, you know, like I said, 5.30 every day, except for Mondays, is 7.30, and it starts at 4. Yeah, you're supposed, but we to, also... spend... yeah, you're supposed to spend a minimum of three hours, but I'd say the average over everyone is probably like five hours yeah. per week. Yeah. Nice. Wow. That's, that's, that's pretty impressive. I like how you yeah. guys have a really sustained amount of dedication to your teams because um, especially with that many members that – well, actually, let me, let me uh, back that up. How many members does your team have and how many members did the whole ViperBots FTC organization have? Um, so our team has nine members. Uh, yeah. We actually have the smallest team uh, as, term, as far as FTC. 
Uh, other teams have uh, anywhere from 10 to 12, I believe. Um, and then I think the total number in Viper Box... 80? It's about 80. Like, is it 80? I'm, I'm, it's like 80, 81-ish, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And then FRC is like another 18 or something people, so I'd say there's yeah. about 100 kids total in the org. Wow. That's super yeah. impressive. And yeah, that brings me back to my point, because like, getting that many people to have such a sustained amount of dedication, it's very, very impressive. So, um, Tyler, actually, could you please open up that document with, uh, with, the, with Snakebite's robot? Um, so, could you tell us a bit about your robot this year? Um, it looks really good. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the main thing that it's kind of first right in front of you is uh, the aluminum that we use. So we actually got the aluminum water jetted, and then we got it powder coated white. Gives it that nice clean look. Um, that kind of comes out. We are also almost entirely custom. We use a few rev extrusions as just support running across the robot, but uh, most of it is, like I said, water jetted or uh, CNC'd polycarbonate, um, 3D printed parts. Yeah, almost all of it is custom. So uh, what does your robot do this season? Um, so it's kind of tucked in right now, but we have an in intake that kind of folds out. And uh, unlike many other intakes, it is pretty, it doesn't extend very far. Um, it actually just extends just enough so that we can flick minerals on the outer edge of the crater over the, the crater wall and then up to the inner intake into a basket that kind of raises vertically and scores. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not the most common design. However, we've had pretty good success with it so far. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. How, how have you guys been doing uh, both in your competitions and in relation to other Viper Brothers teams? Um, so after the last competition, which was the third league meet, we actually had the highest OPR in Viper Bots with 160. Um, yeah, second highest in Austin. Yeah, or... yeah. Uh, so we've been, we think we're pretty happy with where we are right now. We'd like to, of course, get better. Um, we're making small fixes to do that. Uh, our auto is pretty good. It's uh, Raymond can talk more about it. Um, yeah, um, it does all the like um, basic tasks. It delatches, hits the right sample, um, goes into the crater, and then um, also places a team marker. It's pretty consistent. Like our auto OPR for last league meet was um, 71 out of a max 80. Although there's a little bit of you know wiggle room with the OPR calculation. I think we only missed one part, so it should be a little bit higher. But uh, uh, <laughs> can you do? And then, uh, yeah. And then, in terms of teleop, we uh, we do right now. We're doing about ten to twelve minerals, uh, which is not that high. But it is important to note that we only do the depot side. Uh, this was kind of a competitive advantage we decided on. If you also notice, our robot is pretty short. It's actually twelve inches tall, so we are able to drive under the lander, um, which we think will come in important pretty late in the season. Um, we'd like to get our cycles higher, um, but it is pretty. It's much harder to score on the depot side. Um, and we'd like to kind of maintain a balance between playing defense on the crater bot and scoring minerals. And uh, for right now in the season, we are pretty confident with how many minerals yeah. we score on the depot side. Yeah, uh, what he's talking about is that some robots like to start in the crater side and stay in one position so they can uh, have the optimal speed for minerals scoring, whereas we emphasize mobility so we can play defense, score a few minerals, and hang, stuff like that. And uh, we can't see it in this picture, but what are you guys using as your drivetrain? Is it a regular six-wheel drop center? Um, so it started off with a six-wheel West Coast. Um, mm -hmm. We actually transitioned, though, to doing uh, two powered st uh, stealth wheels that are Coulson's and then one unpowered Omni. Uh, ah, okay. it, it is drop center, uh, 16th inch. Um, however, the we found that the turning was still kind of not quite perfect. Uh, that's why we did switch to the Omni, and we've had great success with it ever since. Absolutely. A 2-1 two, two one on one side, is that, that's pretty impressive. And it allows you to maintain that stability um, in terms of defense, as you were mentioning. Yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I'm going to be a little more technical here because I'm quite interested in this bot. It looks beautiful. Um, so have, uh, what, what do you guys, what's your um, weight at, and have you guys had any issues with trying to get uh, within the constraints of this year's challenge? Because there are a few new things that are added. Yeah, uh, right now we weigh about 37 pounds. Um, so we're, we're getting close, but um, we're pretty, I think we're pretty happy with where we are. I don't think we're going to make too many big, heavy additions so i think we'll be good with the weight constraints um and in terms of other sizing constraints it uh the 12 inches has been a little bit of a challenge um but it hasn't been too bad it basically just meant adding another stage to our lift um to get the extra height that we need um and yeah the 18 inches has been fine as always uh cat everything before you build and you'll be good <laughs> Absolutely. i know my team we were always at at like 17.99 inches yeah. and they had it this year and are like an inch under in every direction it's great 
<laughs> yeah, that's 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 pretty great. So um, for you guys, like, um, uh, in terms of the Viper bots, like the design strategy at the beginning of the season, like right after kickoff happens, um, how do you guys do your design? Is it a collaborative environment where you guys all sit around, sit down, bounce ideas off off of each other, and then split up, or are you guys all immediately sort of uh, divergent so that you can you can have your own designs and you can all be um, very unique? Raymond, do you want to take it? Um, I can. Uh, I don't really know. Okay, so um, basically, <laughs> hardware, both hardware and software-wise, we all watch the reveal video together in the same room, along with most other awesome teams and like some San Antonio teams. And then a afterwards, we'll have like a 30-minute, um, you know, just eating, maybe making a few comments on game. You know, oh, this mechanum drive train is going to be good. Stuff like stuff like basic stuff like that. And then we'll go in the afternoon. Each team will go to some location for instance 46 is my house and then they'll have their individual design meeting uh based, and they okay. it'll just be people on their team commenting on what they think they should do um yeah and it's a good op um since everyone's there it's a good opportunity to kind of synchronize software and hardware goals to design the sort of optimal robot because you don't get that chance extremely often but yeah uh uh, that's pretty cool. Um, like, so, so, is there any kind of collaboration in this initial stage other than that first thirty minutes, or is it like n nothing really? It's it's pretty much completely yeah. separate. Yeah, that's like awesome, I said, yeah. we're all pretty competitive, so it's it, it, a lot of people are pretty secret. You know, no one really uploads their cat so other people can get it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. It's that's like just opposite of everything that we've done in a JV varsity system. So it's cool to see teams with a lot of success doing individual stuff like that. Nice, yeah. And so um, can you guys, uh, a, a question from the chat, um, could you describe the funding for your guys' teams, your, your structure of, like your monetary structure? Because fund, like funding so many people must be a challenge. I don't um, know how in-depth I can go. Um, absolutely. Yeah. To, no, no, uh, we yeah. don't want to step on your toes here. Uh, I will say... Um, Whenever you apply and you join, there is a, a fee that you have to pay. Um, it, it is a bigger fee for FRC as well if you do get on that team. And then apart from that, uh, people in the past and people now work very hard to secure us grants um, and stuff like yeah. that. So so there is uh, a lot of funding does come from the students um, who join uh, the program because, you know, it is a, an application. It is a prestigious selective program that you have to join. So there is a fee for that. And then there is additional uh, grants that we get from uh, the other places. Yeah, the All district right. pays a lot of money for us, too. We're pretty well funded by the district. Yeah, we are also school. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah, and so, the, Oh, sorry, oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, were you going to ask a follow-up question? Uh, no, we're good. Okay. So Adam from 14.85 or 75 asks in the chat, what are the role of your adults and mentors in such a big program? Oh, uh, that's a great question. So that also kind of differs per team. Uh, so we have like three main teacher sponsors uh, who have been with the program for multiple years. Um, and then each team also has an additional teacher sponsor um, that kind of just use their room for meetings. Um, you know, kind of we have school day time called PIT where we kind of have a meeting every week and you just kind of go to that teacher's room. Um, but in terms of involvement, like I said, it kind of differs per team. I know personally with our team, there's almost no teacher involvement or, or mentor involvement for that matter. Um, it's kind of all based on us. And the program does pride itself in being student run. Um, so the mentors are just kind of there to facilitate the process. And they do a lot of behind the scenes work with like registering, funding and stuff like that. But in terms of involvement with, you know, hardware, software, marketing, stuff like that, it's, it's very minimal. It's very yeah. minimal. Yeah. Um, there's also like parent mentors, like each team can have like one parent volunteer to be a mentor. They generally have experience in like hardware, software, and marketing and able to provide, provide some insight on that. Like, uh, my dad's the mentor and for our team, and he's an electrical engineer, and he often like says, oh, are you sure you can do this, stuff like that, keep it you know, real. Uh, but the ideas generally come from us and not from the mentors. Absolutely. So we have two more questions, two questions that are actually quite closely related. Um, we, this is about your eight hour limit. So um, do you guys work outside of your room with like your catting and uh, like other things that you can do, like your programming and stuff um, that can be outside of that eight hour limit or uh, is it all constrained within those eight hours? Yeah, so um, I know certainly from a CAD standpoint, uh, uh, most of the CADing does happen outside of that eight hours. Um, I do it on, at home. Uh, and I I put a lot of work in CAD wise uh, hours, so definitely more than more than eight certainly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like um, compared to sorry, I'll interrupt quick. 
oh, compared to yeah. like a lot of the workload from really competitive teams outside of that, eight hours feels like nothing. Oh, so for that's sure. That's really impressive. Yeah. yeah. So do you guys feel that those eight hours are constricting um, or do you guys sort of uh, w- what are your thoughts on that limit in uh, in, in the state of Texas? Uh, personally, yes, I do feel like those hours are very constricting. Um, they do kind of help us out like Friday afternoons don't actually count for that eight hours. So sometimes it does go late in the 530 um, as per UIL rules. And also weekends don't count. So usually the room will be open up uh, for like seven hours on the weekends on Saturdays every once in a while. So that does help a lot. And uh, as long as you manage your time well outside of the robot room, I think you can work with those eight hours very well. I know for me, I, I always make it a goal to make sure I have everything catted and all my print files ready before I go to the room. That way I can spend all the time building and time with the robot. So um, I think if you plan your time well, it is doable. However, I do feel it is a little constricting for sure. Yeah, yeah there's also like a robotics period you can enroll in, which doesn't count towards your eight hour limit. Um, it's like one and a half hours every other day. Um, which kind of helps you get towards that time. Like if you're in that period and doing eight hours per week, you could probably average like 12 to 13 hours per week, uh, which gives you a little bit of extra work time there. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so, uh, well, there was another one. Uh, so if for you guys, like, would you guys, would you guys particularly um, choose to be in a smaller program if you guys had that choice? Uh, that's a great question. Personally, all I've ever known is Viperbots. However, if I give it some thought, I think I would uh, remain in a large program. Um, I do really like having the competitive atmosphere, and I really like having a lot more people. It's kind of a larger sample size. Um, I have some, some of my best friends are in Viperbots, kind of stuff like that. You know, there's just more people, which means more experiences, more ideas. Um, just kind of, I feel like it opens you up more for experience in the in the work world. Maybe in the future, you know, you're gonna have larger companies and smaller companies. Personally, I, I really do enjoy having a lot of people in the organization. Yeah, I think I would also go for a bigger team because um, I kind of like leaving behind a legacy with a small team of like three to four people. The team will most likely disband after, say, three people graduate. But whereas with, if you're in a Vibros program with like ten people every year. You kind of your knowledge builds on the previous year's knowledge, and it kind of helps make the whole org better. Yeah, so. actually, that that's I think that's a very good way to think about like uh, FTC as a whole. Because in my experience, at least, FTC is like a very short-lived type of program. There are not many older teams here, um, but like yeah, and uh, so in terms of uh, relating to that, actually, what's your guys' like sustainability plan? How do you guys ensure that your knowledge is transferred generation to generation of student and uh, uh, make sure that like, make sure that you guys don't have sort of like lapses and like uh, weak years versus strong years and things like that? Um, so that's kind of all in the hands of the veterans. So um, in a perfect world, you know, everyone would pass on that knowledge perfectly, but it, it doesn't happen all the time. You do kind of see instances where it may be Usually you see the year after people graduate because you kind of see the rookies. It's finally in their ballpark and, you you know, maybe they struggle a little bit. And that's where you kind of see maybe the veterans didn't do the best job at helping it's out the rookies in their ballpark. Um, but it's really just in your hands. So I know for sure me and Raymond have uh, kind of done a really hard. We've been working really hard to make sure our rookies are trained up and uh, we really want them to succeed in the future. So um, I'd say it's yeah, it's really kind of put into the older members of the team and whoever's kind of the leadership roles. Um, in terms of preparing the younger students or the rookies for the future. Yeah, and also we kind of leave a lot of artifacts behind. Like, I think in our marketing cabinets, we have, like, engineering notebooks dating back to, like, 2012. Yeah. So knowledge is there. And I have access to GitHub's um, back to Velocity Vortex, so I can check there if I need a refresh or something like that. Oh, okay. Oh, no worries. Um quick i think i figured out the resizing things be when t- people mute themselves so your team comp- does your team's composition normally change a lot year after year like how many members do you say change every year i'd um, say on average um i'd say on the average 50% like maybe like 30% are people who were previously on that team maybe like 10 to 20% are people who are on a different team and 50% are new. And in general, it's mostly 50 half new, half old um, kind of deal. Um, Interesting. Yeah, but there are like some weird cases like this year. Um, I think Hyperfang has like 11 people and nine of them are new or something like that. Um, yeah. yeah. Wow. Wow. So like it, it, in terms of that, do you guys feel like that's more of an advantage? Like, uh, 
well, I mean, it might. This might be a little weird in terms of a question, but do you guys feel like that is a significant setback, or do you think that it, it really allows your team to get different perspectives and sort of have a uh, have a very dynamic uh, dynamic interaction? Uh, personally, I feel like it's it's been kind of in the middle. Um, you know, four different years. I feel like uh, some years I feel like having a bunch of new people or maybe keeping a bunch of uh, older people kind of hurt us. Um, but some years I think it definitely helped us. I think this year we have a really great mix of people. Um, you know, we have a really good team atmosphere, I think. Everyone kind of gets along. Um, and I do think that it is a nice balance of, you know, kind of half new, half old. So certainly I think it, it can hurt or help you. Um, this year, though, I think I think it's very it's very helpful. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, even some of the new students have FTC experience because the two middle, nearby middle schools have a pretty strong FTC program. So even if you get a new person, they could have more knowledge than, say, a veteran. Wow, that's really cool. That's awesome. So, so um, you guys mentioned that you are doing primarily depot side scoring this year. Yes. So, for people who are watching, who are hoping to be picked by like a good team this season, what do you think high end teams are going to be looking for in alliance partners? And side question, what are you guys looking for? Um, I think at the end of the day, it's all going to come down to consistency uh, with your auto and with your teleop. Um, you know, people can talk about minerals all day long, but um, I think especially in elimination matches, I don't I don't think until the highest levels, kind of the world's level, I don't think eliminations are really going to be decided by how many minerals people are scoring. I think it's going to be more decided by did someone miss a hang? Did someone's auto not work correctly? So I know certainly for right now at this point in the season, um, I think the most important thing you should be doing is make sure you're getting your 130 points a match from your 80 auto and your hang. Um, any minerals you do on that are definitely going to be helpful and will help you win a match. Um, but I think right now, especially us we're looking for that from an alliance partner um i think that is more important than you know how many minerals can you score unless you're scoring an, a super high amount consistently but yeah for us it's definitely for our alliance partners it's the most important thing is definitely not messing up on the simple stuff like for instance do you watch is worth 30 points but if you should do it you should theoretically be able to do it every time just because it's so, such a basic movement usually and if you can't do you probably can't do the rest of the auto because you're stuck on the hook so it's kind of essential to have these basic components and then we'll look at more complex stuff like minerals and how consistent get sampling and stuff like that. Okay. So with that, I think we're about ready to roll for our giveaway. So, oh, start our giveaway. Excuse me. Let's see here. We are giving away one awesome first update style mug courtesy of Redfish Robotics. So it sounds like our keyword is going to be Viperbots. And we'll probably just do all lowercase and V-I-P-E-R all one word, B-O-T-S. So just type Viberbots in the chat and make sure that you're following the stream. And if you're a sub, sub, you get five times chance to win. So one more time, that's Viberbots, all one word. Type it into the chat and hope you can win. Let's see. So we want to move on to our next question. Um, what are some of your favorite moments in FTC? Um, for me, probably my favorite moment was going to Worlds my sophomore year during Velocity Vortex. Um, that was just, it was amazing to be kind of on the, the stage. You know, everything's so cool at Worlds. Um, just meeting teams from all over the place, uh, you, can, you know, actually different countries and stuff. It was, it was actually a really cool experience to just kind of see beyond Texas, um, for sure. Yeah, and to, to follow that up, so um, how, how, how did you guys, like, uh, how did you guys learn from a dynamic of, uh, of like, teams from various regions? Has, that, has uh, that interaction been helpful in terms of your guys' design programming processes, or um, um, how, how does that work for you guys? Raymond, you can take that. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so you're saying how we learn from seeing other teams, basically? Or? Yeah, how, how did learning from other teams outside of your region, or if you guys interacted with, uh, uh, with them extensively? We don't really interact extensively with other teams. Like, um, I'll I'll use it for um, software to get a good idea of sort of what's possible. Like, I watched like one. Um, it was a stream from some state in West last year that showed um, someone getting uh, two blocks in autonomous with a fairly simple, uh, similar design to what we had for the output mechanism. And I kind of use that as inspiration to see what's possible. Is this a realistic goal to pursue? Um, I'm not too sure if Matt uses it for hardware hardware much, but um, yeah. I don't, yeah, I would say definitely the most important thing is uh, make sure that your team is compatible with any other team, right? 
So there are definitely some like metas that kind of develop within certain states and certain areas. So, you know, like maybe, you know, in our league, you know, there's kind of certain things that you're supposed to do in terms of auto paths and stuff like that. But when you interact with teams from elsewhere, you know, you kind of don't really know what to expect. So whether that's adding a delay to your autonomous, maybe doing an alternative path, kind of stuff like that. I think working together is really important, especially in terms of competitive levels and higher on. You know, you want to make sure you can do as much as you can every match and you don't want to be colliding with your alliance partner. Um, yeah. Interesting. I've... So it looks like we have a question from chat from Dom. I'm supposed to ask Matt if Gambino or Kendrick is better. Ooh, that's a good question. Um, overall, I'd, I'd probably have to say Kendrick. Seems reasonable. It's not my genre, but hey. <laughs> okay, and then Elon uh, ninety four twenty one asks: Is there any ever any alliance selection drama, like between multiple Viperbots teams? Um, I have one funny story, and then I'll kind of give you a real answer. Uh, so it was actually my freshman year during rescue. Um, we were one of the captains, and we were trying to select Team 6210, uh, Strike, who's another Viperbots team. They were the pick for us uh, based on our scouting. They were the definite pick, kind of, you know, there's not really much Viperbots preference, um, honestly, but they were definitely the pick. But funny enough, there's another team in uh, Austin awesome Metro League called uh, their team number 6710, uh, the Sigmas from Westlake. And, um, when our captain got the mic and was ready to make the pick, he actually misspoke and said uh, selected team 6710 instead of 6210. <laughs> um, so that was a pretty funny thing. But in actuality, um, since, I, since I've been saying that all the Viper bots are super competitive, there's actually no real favoritism at all between who they pick. Um, every team scouts. We do scout collaboratively depending on our vision sometimes just to make it easier. But... Uh, most people just go straight off the record, yeah. straight off the stats, just to try to be as competitive as possible. Because, you know, with eight teams, you know, everyone's trying to advance. So, you know, if you make a, a pick with a worse Viper bots team, that might hurt your chances to advance because you might be worse off in elimination. So um, there isn't really much preference between choosing teams. Yeah, I will say that it usually works out in favor of Viper bots. Like, if you're a Viper bot, you'll see every other Viper bot run, like, you know, tens of times. Whereas at a competition, you only see them run five times. So if they're having like a bad day for autonomous, you could potentially get a really good second pick just because some people are going to underestimate them, but you actually know their true potential. Nice. And to actually follow up with that, what's the Viperbot scouting dynamic like? Um, so usually teams scout individually. Um, I know for us, we did scout with a few other teams like Hydra last year. Um, it kind of depends on where the divisions are drawn. Uh, so I think last year... It was kind of four teams in one division, four in the other. And so the way we scouted was we watched every robot, every match. So, you know, you usually there's only three to four people that can be scouting from each team. Uh, so we usually had those people work with the other people in Viperbots. We also worked with uh, Team 12670 Eclipse, who wasn't in Viperbots. We just scouted with them as well. Um, but, yeah, so the scouting process can be collaborative. I know in years past it was all individual um, you know, certain teams, you know, never made ELMs or something like that. So maybe they didn't get quite as included in the scouting process. Um, it just kind of differs based on what the team wants to do. Yeah, our scouting is just pretty standard. It's just entering stuff into a spreadsheet and it'll give you some stats about the team. Nice. So, um, uh, and actually to, to just build upon the Viper bots, like how, how you guys are, um, I noticed that like there are very distinctive themes, right? Um, like uh, for example, Quad X is very famously known for their wooden robots um, having that sort of aesthetic. Um, how do you uh, do like is that something that's very very prioritized within the teams to keep their aesthetic or to keep their branding? And how important is branding to the entire organization as a whole? Um, so branding from kind of a aesthetic standpoint, I'd say it is pretty important. Um, Quad X, everyone knows, you know, is the gold. The, the wood and the 3D printed uh, materials, they've kind of always been that. Some the teams foam. aren't. They always have the foam. <laughs> yeah, they always have the foam. Some teams aren't too big on that. Um, I know this year, especially us, we, I, uh, we took it as a really big priority to brand ourselves. That's kind of why we went with the, the powder coated white aluminum. Uh, you don't really see many teams go for white robots, you know, because yeah. it can get dirty and whatnot. But I know for this year, we really did pride ourselves on the branding and that was a big focus. Um, in years past, it kind of just de depends on the team, what they want. Um, you know, some teams might think that going for a certain aesthetic might hinder their ability, so they just don't worry about it at all. Um, and then outside of that, branding is really important. Each Viper Bus team has their own color. Quad X is gold. We have purple. 
stuff like that. So, uh, you know, it is kind of important to make sure that everyone, you know, stays separate. Um, you don't want to give off that vibe that, you know, we're just one huge team because I know uh, that is a problem. Um, and then Viper Bots as a brand really does pride ourselves. You know, we, every event we go to, we always make sure to, you know, BGP. We always try to help out the event coordinators and stuff like that. We just try to give Viper Bots a really good standing and uh, we just love helping out as much as we can. So. Absolutely. Um, uh, I have a, a, just one last question from my side. So like how, in terms of, in terms of like the lessons that you guys have learned interacting with individuals, what do you think is the biggest takeaway that you can, that you guys can have like working with each other as, uh, like in such a large organization that you can take past high school, past like this age level, um, into like the future? That's a great question. Um, for me, I'd probably have to say, um, you know, don't be afraid to ask for help. That's definitely something uh, I would say. You know, as a as a rookie, you know, you kind of you're a little like it's really it's a big room and a lot of different people and a lot of older people. And you know, you kind of like hear about these teams, like you know, going in there, you're like, oh, Quad X went to Worlds last year and did really good. Like that's crazy, right? So for me, it was a big thing to be like, it's okay to go to these really good teams with these older people and ask for help. You know, don't be scared. You know, everyone's everyone's there to be your friend. Everyone's, everyone wants each other to be good. So I think that is something I can take um, into later stages of my life with work. You know, don't be afraid to ask people for help. Don't be afraid to ask people with seniority or more skills than me. Um, just try to learn as much as possible with whatever situation you know you have. Yeah, I think the biggest takeaway I can take from Vibrobots is that you have to get really good at planning later on in life. Um, like, in our Vibrobots program, we'll have pretty strict deadlines, like, you know, software needs to be done by uh, January 17th or something like that. Uh, but you won't often have, you know, people young into your ear in real life. So you need to set, um, and because of these deadlines, you'll never, you'll, well, sometimes, but you'll, most, most teams don't, aren't doing the whole robot, you know, Friday night before the competition. They have a, they can pace themselves. Um, you need to be able to set these goals for yourself in real life because, you know, our mentor won't be there <laughs> always. Absolutely. Um, so there was another question in chat. Um, so, is there a Viperbots team which is considered your quote unquote flagship team or is there, is, do you all have your, or are you all like more or less equal in terms of the progression and uh, how like t people are divided within your teams? Um, so there's not really a flagship team. Uh, 4545 is the oldest team. Uh, but apart from that, you know, every team gets added every year and it's pretty even. Yeah. Awesome. Interesting. Uh Oh, so we have one last qu one last question in the chat. Looks like, how do you guys keep your alumni collected, or connected? Excuse me. Connected. Um, if you do. Yeah. Do you guys have an alumni connection? Do you guys have a yeah. lot of involvement? And if you do, um, how does it work? We we have a Viperbot Discord, and there's like a ton of alumni on there. But um, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, but uh, beyond that, like. High school generally starts before college in terms of semester. So often on like January 5th or whenever you get back from school, you'll see alumni come in, you know, look at their former team's robot, give them a tip or two and, you know, kind of talk about the college experience. Yeah, That's pretty cool. And uh, I actually had one more question. Uh, how is the... Um... How is the Austin Metro League? How is that? How is your particular region conducive to having such a large and uh, renowned presence in your community? Um, I think the region's really used to it, and I also think the region's really motivated by it. Um, a lot of people consider Austin Metro League to be very competitive, and I do think that because of Viperbots being so competitive themselves, other people are more motivated to do really well as well. Yeah, um, and this is just um, another thing too. We we help out other FTC teams, other LFL teams too, but I'm not sure how competitive the FLL is here. Um, um, like for instance. We mentor the middle school teams nearby and uh, some community teams nearby we mentor, but in general, we also have parts ready, advice ready at competition if other teams need it. Nice. Awesome. So um, with that, uh, we're about ready to roll for our giveaway of one awesome first updates now mug, courtesy of Redfish Robotics. So chat, you have one final chance to type in quote unquote Viper bots, one, ver one word, no caps. Um, and with that, uh, Tyler, uh, can you roll our roll for our winner? Absolutely. <clears throat> Excuse me, man. Uh, just uh, mention as well, too, if you're interested in other mugs from Redfish Robotics, just type Redfish Robotics right into Amazon. You'll be able to see some of the other mugs that we have up on screen as well. Uh, with that said, our winner for tonight is going to be 
Uh, C. McBride, 166. Congratulations. <laughs> Uh, for being uh, winner of the hundredth time, apparently. So, uh, so C. McBride is going to win the uh, fun mug. Congratulations and uh, thanks for uh, following fun. Appreciate it. All awesome. right. So with that, I have one final question. What is your favorite mess up that you or another team in FTC has done throughout the years? Ooh, for me, it's definitely got to be flipping off of the rescue mountain. Those are always great. <laughs> Uh, picking the wrong team, that was another classic. Um, you know, there's been many different fails uh, throughout my four years, for sure. Oh, wait, I have a quick question. When you picked the wrong team, did you lose or win, do you think, because of that? Um, I actually don't think it ended up mattering. Uh, they were actually pretty equal. Um, we did end up losing, but I think it would have been the same outcome either way. Uh, it's hard to pick a favorite. Um, let me see. <laughs> I think my favorite, I don't remember the details too specifically, but my favorite mess up probably last year was during one competition, um, the color sensor or something wasn't or working, so I, or not color sensor, something wasn't working, so I just guessed the column to place the glyph in, cause, um, and then I guessed the right column, and I got extra points because of it. Um, yeah. I mean, happy forever. accidents, happy accidents. Yeah, I, I, think, I, think that's, I think that bonus actually mattered. On the outcome of the match, but I can't remember. <laughs> uh, sometimes you just have to pray to RN Jesus. <laughs> oh man. So, with that, thank you guys to all the follows and subscriptions we received today. Don't forget that you can, guys can subscribe for free if you or your parents have Amazon Prime. We hope you guys enjoyed this episode of FTC Live. If you want to stay connected with what first updates now FTC is doing, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at FunFTC. And join our Discord through the link in the chat. On behalf of myself, Ethan, and our awesome guest tonight, and as well as our producer, Tyler, for working behind the scenes, um, I'd would, I would like to thank all of you for tuning in. Um, t- um, for tuning in. And uh, be sure to let people know that we're doing these shows every other Wednesday. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you guys so much. Thank you to all of our co-executive producers, keeping fun loud, live, and independent. Pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now.